السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته كيف حالكم جميعا يا أيها الإخوة أخوات إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور ينفوسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مدل له ومن يدل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أما بعد This particular topic this morning is a requested topic It's a topic, alhamdulillah, that I wanted to speak about for quite some time um, And the way that I'm going to approach this topic by the permission of Allah Jalla wa ala would not be in your traditional way, um, nor is it to be approached from a traditional way here. Polygyny is a discussion that is a hot topic in Islam, is a very hot topic in Islam. And it is misunderstood often. And also most people, when they think of polygyny, especially people who have practiced it or have seen it been practiced before, especially in this modern age, we can say that <clears throat> not majority of the cases have hit the actual mark of ta'addud. So polygyny in al-Islam, brothers and sisters, the Arabic term for it is known as ta'addud, okay? And it is more than one wife as opposed to when a person be in a monogamous relationship where there's only one man and only one woman. We're not going to delve into polygyny in this discussion first and foremost. For me, in order to address polygyny properly, we have to understand what type of man and what type of woman, specifically what type of man is needed in order to practice polygyny. So in order for me to do that, I have to address an issue which is known as al-rujula wal muru'a. Um, and that is dealing with masculinity and that is dealing with moral um, character, moral upright character. What type of man is ideal for the practice of polygyny? Um, does this man embody embodies what we call muru'a? Because masculinity in manhood in Islam according to the righteous predecessors has an understanding and the ayat where Allah Jalla wa ala mentioned the famous verse that we all know and if you fear that you will not be able to deal justly with the orphans then marry other women of your choice Two, or three, or four. And if you fear but if you fear as though you're not going to be able to deal justly in between the four, Allah Jalla said, then marry one. And this is more better to prevent you from doing injustice. Before, you know, alhamdulillah, before delving into this particular verse, which comes in Surah Nisa, the fourth chapter of the Quran, which I believe is the the fourth actually the third verse it's the third verse of the fourth chapter so if something must be understood when dealing with polygyny and the first thing that we're going to mention is that is not wajib okay polygyny is not wajib to adult is not obligatory okay that must be a disclaimer that must be understood under no circumstances is polygyny obligatory in the deen. Okay? There are different opinions from amongst the ulama in terms of the usul of a man and a woman. Some of the scholars say that the man should have two, so forth, but it's still no hardcore evidence, even from the verse itself, that polygyny is obligatory. I wanted to make that disclaimer. Tight. So let's start. What is rujula? What is muru'a? For someone to properly practice polygyny, to add in this modern age, then we need the ideal man. 
We need the man that can take on this responsibility. But we need a man that is different, not just a male, a dhakr, because a dhakr is different from a rajul. Okay? A dhakr is different from a rajul. Something that must be understood. So the Islamic concept of masculinity, manhood, or manliness, al muru'a, can be summarized by the broad ethical injunctions of the Quran and the Sunnah. It is reported by Ibn al marzuban on uh, that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he passed by some people who were talking, they was having a discussion. And Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said to them, what are y'all talking about? What are y'all discussing about? And he said, we're discussing the issue of manhood. We're discussing the issue of muru'a wa rujula. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said, aw makafakum allahu azza wa jalu dhak, has not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suffice you in his book when Allah jalla wa ala, he says in Allah ya'mur ya'mur bil adli wal ihsan fal adlu insaf wal ihsan tafaddul fi ma wa tafaddul fi ma baqiya ba'da hada so he says when Allah jalla wa ala, he says in the 16th chapter which is known as surah an-nahl okay in the 90th, 90th verse, Allah Jalla wa'ala said, Inna Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsani. Allah Jalla wa'ala has commanded you with justice and excellence. Justice, Ali ibn Abi Talib comment and said that what is meant by justice in this verse, al-adl, is to have sense of fairness. And he says about excellence, ihsan, what is meant by ihsan in this verse is that you prefer others to yourself. Then he made a statement and said, what remains of manhood after this? So the concept of manhood to Ali ibn Abi Talib was the fact that a man has ethical injunctions, that a man is just, that he's Adam, that a man is Ihsan, that he has, that a person is good, he does fairness, he has excellence. It have nothing to do with physical strength at this point. Notice he did not mention anything about physical strength or about this being a male. Continuing, the source for this is in the book known Al Muru'a. When it comes to man in Islam, we need to understand that the man composed of three things. We talked about this before in previous talks that man composed of what we call a mind, a soul, and a body. Okay? And it's important that to consistently work to improve each dimension of their being, meaning each of these parts need improvement. And this is what you're going to be working on throughout your entire life to make sure that you can have all three of them in sync or in harmony. al Mawaridi reported that Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Aslu rajuli aquluhu wa hasabuhu deenuhu wa muru'atuhu khuluquhu. That Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the foundation of a man, a rajul, not a male, is his intellect, his aql. His honor is in his deen. Okay? And his manhood, rujula, is found in his character. Okay? So he said, Aslu rajuli aquluhu. The foundation of a man is found in his intellect. Okay? His honor is going to be found in his deen, and his rujula, his manhood, will be found in his character. This is quoted by Abu. Adabu dunya wa deen. So the righteous predecessors they understood that manhood to be comprehensive of all religious virtues in Islam. Okay? You might say, brother, why are you talking about this in terms of religion? The reason why we chose to go from this angle and this perspective in dealing with polygyny and ta'addud, because when you talk about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He embodied and he emboldened Rujula and Muru'a. He was an upright man in character, in deen, in honor, and so forth. And he is the ideal example when it comes to us dealing with our wives. As the, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Khairukum, the best of you to your ah is Khair, what? It's me, Li Ahli. The best of you to your wives are me to my wife. 
Also, the Prophet وسلم, is ordered by Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran that we take him as an ideal example. Indeed, you have a beautiful example in the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu so when we're talking about polygyny, we're talking about ta'addud, then we have to look at those men who had rujula and muru'a, right integrity, and they had masculinity, not just were males, and they were able to take on the charge or the responsibility when dealing between women. They understood it. So a lot of males, especially in this day and age, is they think that taking on a problem such as polygyny to addud is an easy feat. It's not an easy feat. Okay? As Um Abdullah the I believe the daughter of Al Sheikh Mukbil, Rahmatullah Ta'ala Alay, in her book called Nasiha to Lin Nisa, Advice to the Woman, she had gave a beautiful parable saying that a man who takes on two wives is like a like a sheep, a long sheep with against two ravenous wolves. If the man is not prepared to deal with ta'addud, polygyny, then he's going to be devoured by those two wives. He's not going to be able to handle and deal with it. Shikr mean in comment on the verse where in khiftum, in this verse where in khiftum, Allah tukusitu, if you fear, he said what this mean, wa in alimtum, if you know, if you know you're not able to be just, you know you're not able to deal with the situation, then do not place yourself in that situation. Um, so that's why we're, we're, we're approaching rujula before we get into polygyny, before we get into the benefits of it, etc., 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 which most people, most men harp on, right? But no doubt, polygyny is beautiful. Tell you. It was said, Amr ibn Ubaid reported that it was said to Al Hassan al Basri, Rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, or radiallahu ta'ala anhu, what is manhood? Hassan said, a deen. Pay attention to this. He was asked, what is manhood? He said, a deen. Okay? It is the deen. This can be found in Al Muru'a. So if you see the earlier predecessors, they did not equate manhood to a physical specimen of a male. His strength, the whether he can produce sperm. None of this was the focal point of what a man was, okay? What is manhood? He said it is deen, okay? Also, Al-Hassan Abbasid is reported to say, إِنَّهُ لَا دِينَ لِمَا لَا مُرُوعَةَ لَهُ That there is no deen for the man without, for the one without manhood. There is no deen for the one without manhood, okay? A person being a man is a person who has deen. So, for you sisters who think that a roughneck or a tough dude is what is considered manhood, you're wrong. For you sisters that think that a hood or a thug is what a man is, then you're wrong. If that thug if that roughneck, if that hood dude do not have deen, he doesn't stand for any integrity. He's a person that cheats, lies, steals, rob, etc., etc. Then this individual is not what we consider in Islam, according to the pious predecessors, as a person who have muru'a or rujula. He's not even fit for marriage. I want you to understand what I mean. This man is not fit for marriage. Nikah cannot even be presented to this man. Because he does not fit the criteria of what is a man. Do you understand? This is important. Because this is an indication of you women. And what's inside of you. That you are attracted to males and not to men with manhood. So then you want a male to give you all of your rights or establish your rights. But that male don't know how to establish your rights because he's not a man. And then you have a man who have Rujula and Dean who can give you your rights and establish it for you. You don't want that person. That, that's an indication. It shows something. Something is wrong. Something is wrong there. A person that's going to be responsible for you. That's what it is. Whenever marriage takes a place or takes hold, Nikah, 
You become responsible for that person. You're responsible for them in every sense of the word. Do you understand? It becomes a full responsibility. Boys can't do the job. Males can't do the job. It's going to take rujula. It's going to take masculinity. It's going to take manhood. It's going to take integrity. It's going to take justice. It's going to take dean. It's going to take someone fearing the Lord before they fear them, fear anything else. That's what it's going to take. And this goes, this is actually true in terms of polygyny. What ideal man that can practice to adult? Polygyny in the modern society. It needs an ideal man, not a male. Not because the ratio is that the woman is more than men. Not because the ratio is that women outnumber men. Not because the simple fact that you might have some financial stability, but you still not prepared mentally, spiritually, physically, etc., etc., to deal with these women, to give them their proper responsibility and take on the proper concern. So what you do is you jump out there and you say, okay, I marry so-and-so and so-and-so and just become a girlfriend-boyfriend relationship. No marriage responsibility whatsoever. As if Islam is not perfected as Allah said, Al yawmu akmeltu lakum deenakum wa atmemtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu islam kum raditu lakum wa islam deena. Allah said, today I have perfected your religion for you. I have completed it for you. I have conferred my favor upon you. And I have chosen for you and I am pleased for you for your deen is Islam. So every aspect of Islam has been perfectly perfected. So that means it has been covered extensively. When it comes to nikah, it has been ironed out in detail. So for a man to take on the responsibility, not only one woman, but he want to take on the responsibility of another woman or even another one or another one, then he have to have certain things in play. Who is that ideal man? And we get that. From the Prophet وسلم, his companions, and from those who follow them, and from those who follow them, and listen to their statements about what is a rujula and what is a man before we start talking about the benefits of polygyny. We start talking about the you know the unbenefits of polygyny. I know a lot of people waiting for me to get into that, but that's not that's not the point. The ideal man is the criteria before you can start practicing polygyny. Um, and don't get me wrong. Of one. Okay, so the next statement that is brought in terms of rujula and murua, and so that you know, murua is used even in the uh, hadith science as well. They they look for a person who have some type of integrity as well. So all of this stuff really go hands to hand. Okay. Ibn Marzubun devoted an entire book to manhood. So the scholars of the past, what they did, they didn't leave any corner or any stone, you know, unturned. In other words, they didn't leave anything left out. If you look into the books, many of the different books of the scholars of the past, mostly all of the topics you can talk about, they actually covered. Whether it's about masturbation, there's books on that. Whether it's about such and such homorphodite, there's books on that. Such as about a man built born with two sexes. There is issues that Islam have covered and scholars have delved back into Islam and dealt and addressed those issues. Same thing with manhood here. An entire book dedicated to manhood. Okay? Where he compiled and documented the sayings of the righteous predecessors on the meaning of being a man. This is some, these books are here, inshallah ta'ala. There is one book that I'm familiar with um, by Sali al munajid even though there's kalam against him, and I'm not even going back and forth with that. The book is good. He brings proofs. He brings evidence. I advise you, woman, is, is, is it, I believe it is in English. I will get the proper name for you. I advise you, woman, and even you men, to get a copy of this book. Go over it with your boys. Explain to them what is manhood. Also, again, there's rujula in the mar'a. With a female, there's rujula. You say, well, brother, how can manhood be with, with female? No, what it means is femininity. How a woman properly becomes a woman. Islam deals, deals with these issues. 
The many shades of, of meaning they attribute to the word manhood in classical Arabic are summarized in the Lang's lexicons. So mainly perfection consisted in abstinence from things unlawful. So your thug, your hoodlum, your roughneck, excluded from this definition. Look at this. Unlawful. Unlawful bi sharia awwalin. Meaning anything that Allah's legislation considered to be unlawful first and foremost takes precedence. Then unlawful within the society that a person find themselves in, even if they in Darul Kufr. But unlawful takes turn with Allah and His Messenger. What Allah deems to be unlawful, what the Messenger وسلم, deems to be unlawful, this individual is abstained from it. Or in chastity of manners, this individual is known to be chaste, not promiscuous. And some art of trade or abstaining from doing secretly what one would be ashamed of to do openly. Which we know the hadith for the Prophet Sallallahu that he said a sin is something that a person feels that he needs to conceal. Something that a person feels ashamed of inside their chest. That they would not feel right if someone see it. That's how you know that that thing is wrong. That you feel ashamed of it. Some people's hearts are so black that they don't feel ashamed of what they do. They don't feel anything. Allah Jalla says about these individuals, Bal Rana ala kulubihim makanu yaksibun. Allah Jalla say, Nay, that's the Ran. And the Prophet he explained in an authentic hadith that the Ran here means that every time you sin, there's a nukta, so that there's a black dot that appears on your heart. And if you do not repent, and if you repent, the black dot removes. But if you don't repent, the black dot grows. And then that blackness grows. So like if you see a liver that is perfected by our that is affected by smoke and you see how dark that liver become sort of the black the blackness of your heart and it takes over so it removes things from you like haya it removes things from you like modesty shame and shyness and so forth so you become a person who do what they want to do and you don't care who sees it you understand first you was a person that concealed just think about it if you go back 20 40 years homosexuality was a thing to be hush hush about Lesbianism was a thing to be hush hush about But if you go now that the hearts become so black It is open public scene now You do it out in the public You don't care who see it This is what he's saying He's saying abstaining from doing secretly what one would be ashamed to do Okay Openly or in the habit of doing what is approved And shunning what is held base Held base Or in preserving Okay Or preserving the soul from filthy actions so, just seeing this definition is showing you about a man who's striving to do right. This is a man who has manhood. We haven't talked about physical <laughs> strength yet, did we? We haven't even spoken about a man who can bench press, who can lift up 400, 300 pounds, a man who in the gym getting it in. Nothing wrong with tuning your body. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing, keep, nothing wrong with keeping your muscular tone or keeping your body tone or keeping yourself in shape. We're not saying that. But we want you to understand that got nothing to do with manhood. Okay? Later on, in terms of a man being able to protect and cause safety, then that has a place that where that will follow or fall into. But that is not what is manhood. Okay, And what disgraces it in the estimation of men, or in good manners in guarding the tongue, and shunning impudence, or in the quality of the mind by preserving what a man is made to preserve in good manners and habits, or manly, uh, or manly virtual moral goodness. This is the Lang's lexicon. This is the definition of rujula or muru'a of a man. You want to practice the addud? Then emulate the Prophet ﷺ. Because all of this here, the Prophet ﷺ embold, embold, he embolded this. This can be found in every fiber of the Prophet ﷺ. This character can be found in the Prophet ﷺ. This is why the Prophet ﷺ was ideal. The ideal man to practice the addud. One of the most important characteristics of a true Muslim man is the ability to forgive others even when the opportunity for revenge is available. And I'm telling you right now, I am tested with this at this very moment. But if you understand the ayat in Surah Tashura, if you understand the ayat in Surah Shura, which is the 42 chapter of the Quran, Allah Jalla wa'ala tell us, do not turn the other cheek, so to speak. We don't believe in the concept of turning the other cheek. But we do, as Allah Jalla wa'ala says in the verse after that, you can exact revenge to the blow that was done to you, but you cannot excel that. But Allah says, for he who pardons is better. 
for he who forgives is better. So Allah gives a higher stage for the one who has the ability to exact revenge but chose not to and to forgive his or her opponent. Okay? This also shows signs of rujula, of a man. Because what is true strength? Is true strength brute force? What is true strength? Is true strength brute force? Think about it. You have an ant that is small. You have a fly that is small. You have these different insects that are small. But you have the ability just to crush them if you so will. But the fact that you chose not to crush them shows what? It gives you a certain feeling that because you have their life that's that minute in your hands, it gives you a certain feeling to know that you can crush them at any moment. True force, brute force is not strength. Strength is having the ability to do something or control over something, but you do not misuse or misabuse or become oppressive over someone. Henceforth, look Allah Azza wa Jalla. Allah can crush us any moment He chose to do so. He can wipe us out and create a whole new race. He can do whatever He wants. But He said, Inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi. Allah said this. No one said this for Him. He said, Indeed, I have prohibited oppression upon myself. I have prohibited oppression upon myself. This is true strength. Someone who can destroy you. At any moment, at any time, and not be held accountable for it whatsoever, but chose not to do it. You understand? This is the true Muslim. We fail to forgive. This quality of compassion stands diametrically opposed to false belief in the alpha male. Because we're, and if you look at it, the, the non believers are kind of like, they're kind of weird here. We're trying to base human beings on the standard of animals. Do you understand? Human beings has been made the Khalifa of the earth. Allah Jalla made them the Khalifa of the earth. So if human beings has been made higher than animals, how can we compare or standard ourselves based off how they set up their, their system? So if you're looking at a wolf and saying that the wolf, the alpha male of the pack, is so and so and you trying to compare that to a man something is wrong we're not wolves our system is not set up like their system this concept of the alpha male no where you get that from we're not a wolf you don't have to compare me to a wolf Allah has made me better than a wolf I have intellect I have aql as Umar al-Qatar said al-aslu rajlu aslu rajuli aqluhu that the foundation of a man is his intellect a wolf doesn't have that. So why would you give me that to be an alpha male and try to save that? First of all, most of us don't even have the strength of a wolf. Do you understand that? I'm talking about in terms of physical. Most of us don't have the strength of a bear in terms of physical. So why would you compare yourself to any of these animals? It doesn't make any sense, right? This is why Allah Jalla wa Allah, doesn't compare us to the animals. So Ibn Umar Zuban Mother Zuban reported it was said to Sufyan and Yunaina. Okay? And if many of you have mountains of knowledge back in the day, you know who Sufyan Ibn Yunaina is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mercy upon him. All things are derived from the Quran, so where is manhood in it? Pay attention to this. All things are derived, are from and extracted from the book of Allah and the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You want to look at any speaker, any person that's talking to you. I don't care how fancy, how eloquent, how intelligent, etc., etc. You don't hear call Allah. You don't hear call Rasulullah. It's not your speech. It's not your speech. Call Allah, call Rasulullah. That's the foundation. The Prophet ﷺ said, I have left you upon something that if you hold firm to it, you will never go astray. That would be Kitab or Sunnah. He didn't say there's going to be groups of people that's going to come and they're going to have another book that's going to substitute this book or they're going to have some other sunnah aspects that's going to substitute other aspects. No, Allah made sure that the Quran and the sunnah remain intact. What's the point of protecting the Quran and the sunnah? What's the point of making sure that the ayahs and the verses is not distorted? What's the point of making sure the sunnah is preserved, the science of hadith, even the kuffar, from amongst the experts of the kuffar, they agree that one of the strenuous science of hadith is the most strenuous science in 
that's known to man, the way that they preserve it, the way that they went forth, what would they would grade sound, what would they grade inauthentic, what would be unsound, what would be this, what would be that. Bukhari saw the man cheating his animal. Because the man was cheating his animal, he turned back, he traveled far. There was no internet, there was no phones. He traveled far to get to the man to get a hadith from the man, but when he saw the man doing some type of deception, some khiana towards his own animal, he, took, he would not take the narration from the man. See the strenuous methods that they went to for the science of hadith. Why would Allah preserve the deen like this? If these books, if the kitab and the sunnah was not meant to be the guidance for us. Why would Allah go so far to preserve it? We have to look at these type of things. We have to look at them. I want to get back to this tremendous statement by the permission of Allah. Jalla wa look what Sufyan says. I gotta get ready to stop soon. But look what Sufyan says. So he says, he says, he quotes a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says in Surah Al-A'raf which is the 7th chapter of the Quran the 199th, um, um, the 199th verse in Surah Al-A'raf one of the longest portions of the Quran Sufyan al he says that you can find muru'a manhood in this verse Allah Jalla wa Ala, He says Show forgiveness And join good And turn away from the ignorant This is manhood Show forgiveness Khudil afl What muru bil Allah says What muru bil urf And command good And join good Your roughest thug Your roughest gangster Your roughest hoodlum Doesn't have this type of strength when it comes to commanding others with good, you will find they weak. They won't say something to someone in authority. This is why the early man, they praised those scholars who were able to stand in front of the rulers, knowing that the rulers can put them in prison, knowing that the rulers can have them executed, knowing that the rulers can have them uh, subjected to torment, and that they would still stand up in face of those rulers and tell them to, to fear Allah Azza wa Jalla. That takes courage. Suja'a. That takes a type of bravery that just because you can pull a trigger which is a coward just because you can stab someone which is a coward because if you stab someone or you shoot someone without any justifiable thing it's still a coward at the end of the day just because you can do all of that doesn't make you a man but if you can stand in face of injustice you can stand in face of oppression of wrongdoing and you can stand up for someone who is weak for themselves this is shuja'a this is shuja'a this is bravery this is courage this is strength this is muru'a. That's why he says, Allah tells Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khud al-afl. Be one who what? Who pardons. Who show forgiveness. What muru bil urf And enjoying good. And Allah said, Wa a'arud anil jahileen. And turn away from the people who are ignorant. He said, this is muru'a. This is muru'a. Al-Madani, Al-Madani, reported that it was said to Ahnaf ibn Qais. May Allah have mercy on what is manhood? Ahnaf responded and he said, Pay attention. What is manhood? He said manhood is forbearance at a time of anger. Knowing that this individual have insulted you, have caused you pain, has humiliated you. And you want to crush him. Because this is the system and society that we live in. You want to take this man off the face of the earth due to the anger that you have. Huh? He said, no, but you have forbearance at the times of anger. And you have forgiveness at the time of qudra, of power. The Prophet ﷺ returned back to Mecca. He came back to Mecca, this birth town, the place that um, had expelled him, the place that had kicked him out. He came back to Mecca and they thought that he was going to slaughter them. But what did he do? He ordered that the idols be slaughtered and not the people. 
He said that anyone under protection of so-and-so will find themselves protected today. When he had the army that can trust them, he chose forbearance, he chose forgiveness, and this was the actual true power. And it wasn't, this was the Kudra, and it wasn't the other way around, slaughtering them, even though he had a right to do so when they fought against them. Rujula, all of this plays a part in polygyny. All of this plays a part. You have to have justice, the ayat says. Allah tu qasitu. If you fear, and if they mean said fear here, mean in alimtum. If you know you cannot deal justly between them, you have to have adal. Adal is needed when dealing with ta'addud, plural marriage. If you don't have justice and understand what is justice, and if you don't have deen, which is going to back up your practice of that justice, then you might as well forget it. You're not the ideal man for polygyny. Period. The ideal man for polygyny must have these things intact. I don't care if it's a million women to one man. Just because you have a penis, just because you have the ability to procreate, just because you are a male specimen, doesn't mean you are the ideal example for polygyny. Do you understand? I know some brothers ain't gonna like me talking, you know, sitting like this. I'm, it's against me too. I, don't get it wrong, Shake. I would love to practice polygyny, but I still have to work on me. You understand? I have to meet up to these standards to become the ideal male, the ideal man. I have to have manhood, I have to develop myself so that I can be and I can show the beauty of Islam and the beauty of polygyny when I step up to these challenges. By the permission of Allah, Jalla wa Ala. I'm getting ready to stop. It's amazing, man, that if, if you go back and see what the Salaf actually did say and what they actually did view, it, it, it's amazing, man, because we start realizing, man, we ain't nowhere, we're not close to them. We're nowhere near close to them. What we, the movies, the TV shows, the celebrities, the Hollywood, the environment, with our parents and our uncles or our aunts, what they showed us what rujula or manhood was, don't cry, don't be a sissy. Am I wrong? Don't be a tattleteller, am I wrong? Man up, am I wrong? And this is stuff that we find ourselves saying to our children, me included. And we make them think that this is manhood. We make them think that you not have an ability to cry is a sign of manhood. And this is wrong. This is wrong. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is known for crying from the fear of Allah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, the companion of Allah Ta'ala Anhu, he reported a hadith where he said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him to recite Quran to him. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, you want me to recite to you even though the Quran was revealed to you? He said, yes, I would like to hear it from other than me. And he began to recite Surah Nisa, <laughs> the ayat that we're talking about in polygyny. He recited Surah Nisa until he reads a verse. He said, when I looked up, I saw the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam eyes overflowing with tears. And he told me, Hasbuka an, enough, sufficient is enough. Here, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will cry due to this. Because this is an emotion that Allah Jalla says in the Quran, huwa ladhi yubqi wa yabhaq. Allah is the one who gives you the emotion to laugh and He is the one who makes you cry. Ibn Uqayyim, he said that one of the signs of a child crying is a sign of a child letting off what a child needs to let off. Do not stop that child from crying. But we are taught the opposite of what is manhood. We are taught not to cry, to conceal emotion. Abu Bakr al Siddiq, they, was, they, they, they felt some type of way, the females, the wives. They used to say, do not let. Aisha and her mother, she said, do not let my father lead the prayer because he cried profusely. He cannot control himself when reciting the book of Allah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, you are like the woman of, of, of Ya'qub. That he still let him lead. And Umar, everyone want to talk about the shadid, the sternness of Umar bin Khattab. But they don't know that if you look in his biography, he had two permanent tear stains that were on his face because he cried so much from the book of Allah. A man cries. Do you understand that? It's not the opposite of what we are told, what is rujula, 
the alpha male. Huh? That's not what it is. Showing how strong you are is not. Can you be strong when it's time to be strong? How many of you can fight like Ali even to be taller when he was just a child and you had to fight in battle? Many of you would cry right now if you was drafted to the army right now. You'd be crying, trying to fight for all rights. I'm Muslim. I'm Islam. Stop that stuff. You ready for a battleground? Really? Men have integrity. They have principles. They have a foundation. These are the men that are ready for polygyny. These are the men that are examples for their families. These are the men that will build up a generation of that will be right. But not the men that are males, that are crying, that are effeminate, that are emasculated, that cry when every blow hits them. That instead of them thinking of halal ways to actually make it in this world, with everything that the dunya threw at them, with everything that the system is throwing at them, they're still trying their best to make it. A lot of you people, you are familiar with the um, movie Bronx Tale. Everybody likes Sonny, huh? But nobody remember what De Robert De Niro actually said to his son on the bus. That man that goes to work every day. That's the man. That man that actually making it work. Not using a cop out. Not using a way that the system had designed for him to use. That's the man that's trying to provide for his family. But we're not taught that. And you want me to condone someone jumping up there talking about, yeah, brother, I'm ready for polygyny. No, you're not. You ain't ready for no born polygyny. Who you fooling? Abdullah bin Shumayt. Shumayt reported Ayyub al-Saqsayari. Rahim Allah said, لا ينبل المرء ولا تتم مرعته حتى تكون فيه خصلتان الأفو عن الناس وتجوز عنه أنهم. Pay attention. He said a man will not hit the mark nor fulfill his manhood until he has two characteristics: forgiving people and overlooking their faults. The concept of forgiving someone who harmed you, who dealt you wrong. We disobey Allah constantly. This is why no one is more patient than Allah. We disobey Allah constantly, day in and day out. We are ungrateful on multiple levels. Allah Jalla said, Kuti lal insan, ma akfara. Curse be man, how ungrateful he is. How ungrateful man is. And this is why you see individuals who say, I am suffering from depression. Akhi, have you begun to show any type of gratitude? Do you have two eyes? Can you see? Have you shown any gratitude for that? Can you breathe? Are you the control of you breathing right now? Are you just worrying or dwelling on what you cannot get right now? Or what making you feel this way? Can you breathe? Can you walk? Can you talk right now? Can you really ponder and reflect on gratitude? What is it that you have right now that you are sitting here bent over shape of what you don't have? Look at what you do. <laughs> gratitude. Come on, man. That's why Allah Jalla said, Allah said, do not kill yourselves. Indeed, Allah is ever merciful to you. And you cannot enumerate. And if you try to enumerate the many blessings that Allah has conferred upon you, you cannot do it. You cannot enumerate it. So what the light bill is off? So what the electric is off? So what the gas is off? So what the car is not working? So what you can't have a job now? So what you don't have that? You wasn't born with that stuff. That stuff doesn't define whether your life is alive or not. You still can breathe, you still can walk, you still can talk, you still can think, you still can see, you still have a soul. This is what matters. And you're ponding and reflecting and stooping and stuck in some darn depression. But yet you're ready, for, you're ready for polygyny, right? You're ready for polygyny. You can't even get over your own self. You can't even be ungrateful. Allah said, well, in shakaratum la'azidannakum. If you become grateful, if you're appreciative, Allah will increase you. SubhanAllah, Adheem. But an individual tell you and I, they ready for polygyny. But they can't even get over the mental battles that they are fighting day in and day out. But they ready to try to tackle a problem with a woman. 
or tackle a problem with a family and you ain't even ready to deal with what you're dealing with. Show that woman you a rock. Everything is falling down. But you still standing still. As the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they banded him and his family to the mountain pass for three years. They didn't feed them, they starved them. But did Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, did she see one budge in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Did she see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam change from the stance of him being a messenger? Did she see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam start to look at other means that was impermissible or start to compromise his deans or his standards or his principles? Did she see that? Have she saw that you think she would have stuck by that man? No, she praised that man because that man was a rock. Even when he didn't have nothing, he still had something. And even when he got something, he still was grateful for it. That's a rock. That's a man. That's the ideal man for polygyny. Do you understand? This is the way that I wanted to address this topic. We're going to talk about polygyny in another talk, inshallah, because it's going to be a part two to this. But I wanted to make sure we fulfill the role of manhood first before we start saying we want to take on the responsibility of being a person who can deal with polygyny. Okay? And it's important because you, you need the right type of woman as well. You need the right type of woman as well. Now, any woman who's willing to just share you with another woman, she's not the right type of woman. You need a right type of woman who have rujula with herself. A woman who has femininity. What makes a woman? What marks a woman? Not a woman who can just produce. Not a woman who can just sperm. Not a woman who can just procreate. But a woman in every sense of the word. That's the ideal woman you're going to need for the ideal man to be able to carry out the ideal marriage. Do you understand? This is what the components is that we have to get together in order to be able to do something like this. Our problem is that we're ready to jump into the lion's den and we're not even prepared, man. Last but not least, I just wanted to mention this and I'm done. And I can go on and on about this topic, but uh, alhamdulillah, um, this will be enough, inshallah. A true Muslim man should be kind towards people and love for them the same as he loved for himself. And these, all of these are ahadiths. We already know that. A man, a person doesn't have a true, complete iman until he loves for his brother what he loved for himself. All right? Um, he should give off a friendly and a non threatening aura while also putting on the needs of others over himself. He's not this dude who got this don't approach me look. Let me mean mug this bull, staring down, sizing him up. That's what we do as men. We're taught to be predators on each other. Let me mean mug this guy. Let me stare him down. But then he got a big beard. He look at this dude like he's Muslim. How he's Muslim? He's sitting there staring at you, setting it off on you. Like, where you get that from? From the salams itself. It actually tells you that you're supposed to make sure the next person you extend in the salams to is supposed to be safe from your horn, your malice, your tongue, your hands. That's what it says. When you say assalamu alaikum, you are guaranteeing that the person you're extending the salams to is free from your horn. That's a dua, man. Allah anta salam. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Allahumma anta salam. Oh Allah, you are a salam. You are the giver of security. You are the giver of peace. You are the giver of safety. So when you say assalamu alaikum, you are pulling from that salam. You are telling the next person that I am going to prevent my tongue. I'm going to prevent my hands from harming you. That's what you're saying. People out here playing with this deen, man. That's what you're supposed to say. Not size a dude up. I'm sizing him up. I'm making sure, see if he really about what he about. Man, you a coward. Come on, man. You a coward. They put you in a battlefield right now, you running. You ain't ready to be in no dorm battle. You running. You don't got no aim. You haven't took no training. You got no formal physical training in anything. No combat, no nothing. They would come to you. These the type of individuals, they would come to you and tell you, give up your dean or remain in jail for life. Give up your dean or become persecuted. Give up your dean or do this. You can't do what the Sahaba's done. You wouldn't stay and, and, and keep your dean. You would give it up. You already gave your dean up without even anyone threatening you. You don't practice it. That was a form of you giving your dean up. You took shahada so it was something nice. You don't even practice your dean. So when someone come to you and tell you, give up your dean, you would give it up freely. You already did. <laughs> it's not a lot of dean, man. Boys, boys ain't ready for no dorm polygyny, man. We ain't ready for no polygyny. Ain't ready for it. We ready for it. We'll we'll be men like these Sahabas was. We'll be men. That's what we do. 
And we will protect those who are less off. And we will have more strong brotherhood. And we will have more strong sisterhood. And we will be a people out here who are being role models for the example of the dunya. That's what we will be. Because Islam took these, um, these barbaric people that was considered barbaric to the known world. It took these individuals who they were sent to be the lowlies of the known world and it raised them in a span of 30 years. They became leaders of different countries. They became leaders in, 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 in anything. Not only that, they became more intelligent in their speech. They became more intelligent in the way that they give. They became more intelligent in the way that they behave. They became more intelligent in every aspect of their lives. And this was due to the true transformation of Islam. And this was due to them actually practicing it. But we ain't <laughs> honoring Islam. We ain't honoring Islam, man. So a, a, a man, in a nutshell, brothers and sisters, we have to create this understanding of an ideal man. So before I go into actual ta'adud and polygyny, I wanted to bring that aspect first. And then, inshallah ta'ala, if we can at least start to become men, at least start working on our manhood. Trust me, I don't feel as though I am a man. Okay? I'm a father. I'm still struggling with that. I'm learning how to be, to come into full manhood, okay? I'm learning these different things, okay? My father wasn't there, you understand? That's a lot of stuff we deal with too. A lot of us come from broken homes where our parents weren't there. We didn't see a, a, a ideal unit or a family unit of how a man's supposed to be and how a woman's supposed to be. This affects us. Dearly, in terms of how we deal with ourselves and our children. So yes, I'm not. I don't. I don't feel that I am complete. One, one, me giving this talk is, is, is for me more than it's, it's you. I know that I haven't reached these standards yet. The moment when I stop lying, when I actually because lying and truthfulness, truthfulness is a sign of masculinity. When you are truthful, now whether it's for you or against you, you are a person that is a man. When you are, when you are. When you are truthful, you are a person that is a man. When you are a liar and you lie, you're not a person that's considered to be a man. Do you understand? You're not a person that's considered to be a man. You speak the truth, whether it's for you or not. Allah Jalla Allah says it in the Quran, Ya you haladina amanu. Oh you who believe, stand out, kumu, stand out for justice, even if it's against your own selves. That's what the verse says. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So in order to get to that, we're going to have to build up to be men. And a lot of our mothers have effeminated us and emasculated us. And a lot of our, you know, the, the people that we had as caretakers, they have emasculated us. They made us think that, you know, just because if you look handsome, you wear nice clothes, and that you behave a certain way, that you are a man. No, they cannot teach us to be a men. To be men. They cannot teach us to be men. Rujula has a lot to do with integrity, as we see. So inshallah ta'ala, whatever we said that was incorrect, definitely is from ourselves in the shaitan. Whatever we said is correct is from Allah Jalla wa'ala. You can stay tuned, inshallah. Thank for everyone that's listening. You can stay tuned for part two to the polygyny series in the modern age. And then we're going to address what it is to be a woman. We're going to deal with the rujula of al-mara'ah, of the woman next. That's how we're going to approach it before we get to polygyny. Because once we set up the ideal man and the ideal woman, then we make sure that we can fulfill these things. And then we can see whether or not we are ready for these type of marriages and that we can jump into these marriages by the permission of Allah Jalla wa Ala. Subhanakallahum bihamdi ashadu ala ant astakruq wa tubilek. Jazakallah khair.